Welcome to the uh, second uh, tech you. seminar for uh, 2018. And I want to get started on time because I want to let Larry finish his uh, program this time. Larry Galloway, he started, he was at our, our seminar in, uh, in January. And you remember what an interesting program that he did. And uh, I had to cut him off because of time constraints there. So uh, we want to make sure we can let everybody, all the, let him continue that and complete that today. And Tom Dingman's got a nice program for us too on the evolution of C1. So, but writing the book, give me a video. So writing the book gave me an opportunity to reflect on my my time with Chevy. And, and but uh, when uh, I got the opportunity to come here and talk to you folks, uh, am I talking loud enough? Because a lot of people can't hear me. So I uh, I, I started re-researching a lot of my stuff. I really, I, I love talking about cars. Corvettes are my favorite, of course, subject. So, um, I don't know what, I just, thanks so much for letting me come and talk to you. The, uh, the Mitchell Bentley Body Company, I think I told you this last uh, month, maybe, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, it began in 1912 as a uh, uh, Yips Ypsilanti Reed Furniture Company. And at that time, they made Reed Furniture. The governor at the time was uh, Fred Green. He was mayor of, of uh, Royal Oak, or of uh, Ionia, and then he ran for governor and became governor. And he um, started this this Reed Company, and they built bamboo furniture. It was the largest manufacturer of bamboo furniture in the world. They they used 200 tons of bamboo a month. Wow. That's a that's a lot of bamboo. And they had people that would go to Thailand or wherever the stuff comes from, and. Uh, you know, and scout it out and get it and all that kind of stuff. And there's a, uh, there's, there's a, uh, I got a video, I didn't bring it, gee was I didn't bring it, video of, of that, some of that. At any rate, um, he died in 1936, um, and uh, Mitchell Bentley, or uh, Don Mitchell, uh, filled in for him for a while, and then that kind of, um, and they began to run out of steam, and then they started building stuff for World War II effort. They built, they, 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 so anyway, they, they built jeep seats, they built tarpaulins, they built four, they had a contract for 46,000 tarpaulins, 46,000. They sent for the World War to, to the effort in World War II, and uh, the information I've got says they were used by the Russians to build tents uh, and other things. So I guess we won't hold that against them. They were our allies at the time, so. Uh, that's the way that worked. Um, anyway, that's a little background on why that building is there. And of course, it started small. They just kept adding to it. One side was, I thought one side was six floors, but one, two, three, I guess both sides were five. And the Corvettes started in one side, and then they went through that bridge to the other side. So they had a quite a long conveyor. 1965 production started August the 11th, 64. Uh, the, uh, my first uh, introduction to, the, to Ionia was uh, December the 4th, 63. Um, and they started production right after that. The first ones were shipped in early 64. Uh, but this is, a little, this, is a little, this is a letter I wrote back then to my boss. Um, and let's go to the next one. And I, I just took some pieces out of um, out of my letters that I've written over the years and um, things that I thought might interest you uh, and then after I run down you can ask me all kinds of questions if you got any. Um, in a letter I wrote to my boss John Turek in 1964 I told him what had happened since the, the, uh, the launch. Um, See, you know, the 63 Corvette, in fact, I think most Corvettes are pretty tough to build. I don't, I don't know about the new ones, but, but the, uh, the early ones, to paint plastic is kind of a, of a task, task, I think. Um, and the cars are glued together, you know, they're not welded. The tooling was pretty, pretty, uh, uh, the tooling wasn't all that good, it was pretty minor. So. A lot of the tooling right, you know, required uh, location of the parts by the surfaces of the parts, which is still done, but not like the Corvette. The Corvette tooling was not much. At any rate, there were a lot of problems on the first builds. St. Louis was, uh, as I told you last time, St. Louis was very envious of losing half of their production to Ionia. 
uh, they didn't see any reason for it. We talked about that. But um, before start of um, the six, at this time, and when they shut down, they had 36 feet of grinding booth for the preparation of the doors and hoods in Ionia. They, uh, they removed 30 feet of the conveyor uh, between the grinding and the prime booths so they could take a body offline and fix it. Originally, they didn't do that. See, when they built station wagons, they were all metal. And building a metal car is quite a bit different because they could, uh, uh, the paint was reflowed, it was a lot harder, the surface was better. So they didn't need to take a body offline uh, when they built station wagons out of metal. But Corvette, the, a large part of the Corvette plant in St. Louis was dedicated to paint repair. Um, they were repairing it all the time. Um, the, the, and I only the prime bake oven was lengthened 50 feet to improve cure time because they couldn't reflow the paint. Uh, so the paint, paint was kind of soft most of the time. And so it was easy to damage. That's why they had to repair it so much. The second color spray booth was lengthened 15 feet to 60 feet um, with a new air system. The first floor repair line um, with a repair spray booth now has an air supply and bake oven and, and is 28 feet of, of bulbs so they could you know, regulate the temperature of the thing. So um, the uh, 65 startup time was August scheduled for August the 18th. That's when they start, started filling the line. In May of 65, I wrote a letter to my boss, and these are quotes from it. And I said, when finishing the hood opening, this I think you, if, if you got a car that came out of this group, you're going to know it. Uh, when finishing the hood opening above the front fender skirt, the grinder is allowed to ride along the skirt, producing a deep groove in the skirt on approximately 15% of the bodies. This has been reduced from nearly 100% since the item was reviewed with plant personnel in March. Further, further improvement is necessary. So you can, you can envision that. You know, they got to grind that bomb joint along the inside the hood and they let the grinder run down against the uh, inner skirt and put, put a groove in it. So if you got one and it's got a groove in it, then you know about what happened. Uh, a little further on in that letter, I said, Mr. Hubble, who was the uh, paint superintendent, I really like Howard. He was a great guy in peril. Um, he was told not to spray sealer between the color coats. Mr. Hubble stated that his DuPont representative had approved this application, but that Dow Smith will not spray sealer between color coats in the future as of April 28th. I wish uh, Harry Jones was here because I wanted to ask him about that, uh, putting uh, uh, sealer between the color coats. I, I don't, I'm not a paint guy. I don't know the science of that. Okay, one more. Uh, these are, this is the kind of a check sheet we used for our audits. <clears throat> you know, I, I got my start at the Chevrolet St. Louis on Corvette um, as a supervisor of a guy that did the audits. So this was the kind of check sheet we used. We'd put, we'd put serial numbers here, and we'd, th these are the items we'd check. Now this is just for the body. There was <coughs> more sheets for the, the chassis and so on. Um, then you can go to the next one. I got three pictures of this. This is another one. This is the uh, backlight fit, left hand door fit, and so on. Uh, and we, this this was the frequency. But this is the weight. I told you last time that we had 20, 10, 4, and 1 demerit items. So if the backlight didn't fit, we called it a 10 demerits. <clears throat> if it was broken, <laughs> it was also a 10. I think that's kind of funny. I didn't write this. I uh, I was given it. And they said this is what we're going to do. I said okay. So. Um, here a uh, left-hand door fit with 40 merits, and I, I, I mentioned last time a uh, 40 merits was an item that people, uh, their owner would, would not like, and the next time he was in the dealer, he'd ask for it to be fixed. One demerit item was something he didn't, kind of didn't like, but he'd tolerate it. A 10 demerit item was, and a 20 were items that he would go to the dealer and meant for up now, because a 20 demerit item was... Uh, uh, maybe a uh, uh, something to do with well safety, like uh, well mirrors were always a safety item. Uh, I don't think there's any on here for the bodies, but here's a ten right here. The convertible top was damaged, so he would go to the dealer just as soon as he could to get it fixed. If the window wouldn't go up or down. Obviously, that was a ten. Now this shows right down here at the bottom. 
some, some comparison between Ionia and St. Louis. Um, this is this is Dow Smith and this is St. Louis. Dow, Dow Smith had a total of 1,325, 60 merits, and St. Louis had, I'm the way around, Dow Smith had, had 1,800. So Dow Smith had an awful hard time with quality. They just could not, and that's what I'm going to, most of what I'm going to show you. They just, um, and you'll see why. Now remember, this is, this is an audit of an outgoing, this is an outgoing quality audit. So these are cars the plant was all finished with, and they're going to the, to the OK lot to be shipped to a customer. And we found this kind of stuff. Um, and you know, there was a lot different then. 1963, there wasn't much competition from Europe, right? There's some cars around, but not like now. Quality wasn't a big issue. It really wasn't. Um, and, and I think I told you, when I got to St. Louis in, in uh, August the 16th, 1962, they said, where would you like to work? And I said, in a plant, I don't care. I just want to get. I just want to come in. So they said, "Well, we, we have this new department. We call it quality control." What do you think? That sounds good to me. So uh, that was when quality quality was just starting to be talked about. Um, so we did this outgoing quality audit. Uh, this is about Ionia. I got to Ionia December the fourth. Um, I uh, set up their outgoing quality audit, and I, I followed my Corvette. I want to tell you more about that. I bought a 65. In June the 3rd of 65, I wrote a letter to my boss, and I said this. The Dow Smith rework of headlamp end supports, part numbers there, is not a desirable method to accomplish a fit of the headlamp door. When the bearing supports are moved away from design adjustment, the seal assembly will bind the headlight door and shaft as the seal is forced into the end support. Correction of this fit problem must be accomplished by improved tooling. So, shortly after that, a guy named Don Mersion made a tool that would they, would, they would fill these areas. If you got an early 63, 4, 85, if you, take, if you look in here, these surfaces are inside the opening are not finished. You can see the support when you, when you look in there, and, and it, it, that's all right, and they, don't, they just don't look very nice. Anyway, Mergia, Don Mergia, he, we used to, I used to ski with him. I got pretty close to the people in Ionia. I really liked them. There was a guy named Don, uh, uh, John, uh, George McFarland was the chief engineer, and Don Mergia was a chief tool guy. And we used to ski together and socialize. And it was really fun. They're both dead now, I think. But anyway, this, so these surfaces didn't look very good. So Don made a tool that they would butter these up, as we said in St. Louis, to over... Oh, you know, more than they should be. Then he had a tool go in and grind the surfaces. So they were almost like a class A surface on either side here. And uh, it was really pretty nice. So, um, you see, Ionia could do that kind of stuff because they had um, uh, the shops where they could build their own tools. They, uh, they just did a lot of things that St. Louis doesn't capable of doing. Uh, so, because tooling, all the tooling in St. Louis came from Flint. The Flint pilot line, Chevrolet pilot line in Flint, made all the tooling and shipped it to St. Louis. And if St. Louis didn't like it, they could send it out to get it fixed because that, that was their, you, know, you, you take it, use it, or come up with your own somehow. Charlie Bodwell was the, I got, a, I got, a, I got the organization chart later on for <clears throat> Charlie Bodwell was a manager in, in Chevrolet Central Office Quality Control back in the day. Charlie, uh, I told you last month, you know, he was helped us sort the leather. He didn't like to make a decision. Uh, so, but he was a great guy. He came to my wedding. Uh, really a good guy. This letter that I'm going to show you, he wrote this note and stuck on it, and he said, Mr. Gray. Ed Gray was the director of quality for uh, Chevrolet. He says, attached is a good report of the Dow Smith uh, activity. I performed... Uh, and he, so he said, send it to purchasing. Well, Don Bimecock was a purchasing agent. And he, uh, he, used to, he lived with me for a while when he was going through a divorce. But uh, another good guy I liked a lot. But uh, somehow this letter got um, uh, transmitted 
all the way up to the top of, of, of Ale Smith, back across to the pretty high up in Chevy, and back down again. And I came to work one day, and my boss said, you're getting to be a pretty popular writer. And I said, is that right? And he said, yeah. He said, you're, that letter you wrote went, went all the way around the horn. And I wished I'd had a trail of it. But okay, this is the actual letter. You can't read it, so I'm going to just pick out some things and tell you. That, that's what I wrote. The next one. Um, next slide. Most of these inner office letters have down the bottom quality first. I don't know if you saw that. All right. This is this is the roller coaster of quality that Dow Smith put out. They were down at, and in February of '64 they were at around high 20s demerits. We got them down into around 10, and I was there practically performing their outgoing inspection. Then. <laughs> I, I had other things to do, and in a few months, by April, it was up to 100 again. So we came back and reinstituted, reinitiated the, the, the quality audit outgoing, and we got it down to maybe 30. Uh, between June of 64 and February of 65, I was off uh, contacting. Um, Finley Industries, where the seats were built. I told you last month, uh, Brad Osgood over at uh, uh, Detroit School, uh, Detroit uh, Textile Trim, uh, was making seats, and we had a big lot of issues with them. Uh, we had uh, carpets. So in this time frame, I wasn't going to Ionia anymore for a while. So it went back up to about 70, and then with some more effort, we got back coming back down. Well. Um, this is a little background on how the, um, on, on some of the cause, I think, of why they had such a uh, quality roller coaster. In January of 64, a guy named Enrique was the quality manager, but he retired in April. Then in April, uh, Bob Hansen of A.O. Smith from Milwaukee replaced him for a while. Then in July, a guy named England from Dow Chemical Midland replaced him. So there wasn't a lot of continuity. Well, then in December 64, John Wygen uh, came along as quality manager. And John wasn't a very dynamic guy, and he wasn't really very forceful, but uh, he didn't want to mess, uh, uh, do anything to jeopardize his job, so he kind of just kind of went along. But he was the quality manager then for the balance of the time. Great guy to go to lunch with, but really didn't accomplish very much in the plan, I didn't think. <laughs> you know, when you when you go out to suppliers and you, and you work for Chevrolet or any large company, I used to have a little Chevrolet bow tie on my lapel. And I'll tell you, that thing really opened doors. Oh. But everybody was <laughs> nice to you. Because um, they didn't know for sure how much authority you had. But I can tell you, such a reason. On June the 15th, I wrote my boss a letter, and this is the one, this is from that letter that went all the way up and back down again through A.O. Smith. The first five bodies shipped in January 64 were shipped with known defects. When the quality manager, Andriki, was confronted, he said, ship the bodies and let's see how St. Louis likes them. Well, you know, I, I heard that so much. Uh, it, it equates to me, it equates to, uh, I don't think you know what you're talking about. I don't trust you. Well, uh, in February of 64, uh, we drove the demerits back down to, to 10, like the graph show. In March, the defect, we used to call, uh, whenever a supplier ships a part to Chevrolet that's not acceptable, the plant can write a DMN, defective material notice. And that defective material notice is used to back charge the supplier if it's appropriate. And we had a guy in central office, Eddie Lamb, that used to... Uh, uh, work with the suppliers and negotiate those back charges. Well, at any rate, the, uh, the DMN with back charges dropped. They were $51.20 in the beginning. Everybody, well, that was quite a bit of money in 63. Um, that they, they got it down to $4.36, <coughs> which was a little bit more acceptable, I suppose. And they withdrew the back charges. They said, okay, well, we're sort of getting pretty good now, so we won't back charge it. Well, 
the quality deteriorated in April. The charge went back up to five dollars a job, and the demerits were a hundred, like the draft show. By May, Chevrolet inspection resumed to a hundred. We, we checked them all. Um, by um, in May, in June, uh, we got them back down to thirty demerits. The back charges were two dollars and eighty-nine cents. So uh, we were making some progress. Then in December of 65, the demerits were back up to 70 again. So uh, that graph, you know, it's going like this. Uh, I'm okay. Then we have five weeks. I just only go there every other week. Uh, I go a week in St. Louis and a week in Ionia, back and forth. So that by June, you know, by June, we got the demerits down to around 35. And and I wrote, I wrote a letter to my, I wrote in this letter to my boss. I wrote in June. I said, uh, the Dow Smith audit does not assist the plant in improving quality, and that was a fact. You know, they weren't using what they found in the audit to go back in the plant and reduce and, and correct the problem. They just weren't doing it. So they were paying for it. Dow Smith uh, put out a. Uh, a really nice brochure when they opened their uh, plastic plant. They, they realized that, uh, I think this is when Smith, uh, when Inland Chemical got involved. They started to make their own plastic panels because they realized there was pretty good money in it. So they, they, uh, they made door skins, they made roof panels, they made, uh, I don't know about roof, they made door skins and a lot of the interior parts, a lot of the, uh, like, fin, you know, the inner fender skirts, they made those, uh, door inner panels, smaller panels that they could, the tooling wouldn't be too expensive. So this was the this was the brochure they put out. Uh, see this little this little picture right here. I don't know if you can tell what that is or not, but it, it, that is taken from that. They use they didn't use air guns. They use electric tools, and their electric tools were 24 volt, 400 cycles. Um, so that you could touch those wires and you wouldn't get shot. It was it was like a little paddle, and it had a couple of little copper things that went over, and they went down to the tool, and you pull them up and turn them, and, and they slide up and down the copper wires. And when I first saw them, I thought, oh my gosh, this is this is archaic, but it, it really worked. Um, and if you read anything about, uh, I read a little bit lately about the uh, use of high cycle motors and tools. They use a lot of high cycle stuff apparently in airplanes, so that's what they did. That worked pretty good. This guy right here. I wish I had his name. I, I told you I had I bought a '65, oh, and uh, if you read my book, you'd know the story a little bit. Um, the uh, so we put the order in the system. The car was going to come to Detroit and be a part of the motor of the pool of cars that we kept at Central Office. We always had 15 or 20 cars in our Central Office pool. So that when we went to suppliers, we were supposed to drive them instead of driving our own and all that. So my Corvette went into that pool and after it had um, about 3,000 miles on it, I got it for about 35% off a of cigarette. So when when my car was, so I specified that I wanted the body built in Ionia. I don't know why I just did it. So um, this guy right here, <laughs> I was down on the line, my car's going down the trim line. And he's trying to get the CVs into the door and all that kind of stuff, and he's having a heck of a time. And, and I walked up to him and I said, I called him nine times, and he said, Boy, he says, I feel sorry for the poor guy who got by this car. <laughs> <laughs> I said, That's mine. Well, oh, he said, Right. I said, Yeah. Well, he just threw the tools in. He said, We'll finish this offline. So they took it offline and completed it. So it got a lot of, my car got a lot of special attention. Um, but uh, that was, uh, then when they got to St. Louis, the next week, uh, they said, "Well, Larry, we got your car all ready. There it is, all ready to go. It's all polished, and, you know, clean, and beautiful, and everything." And I said, uh, "That's not my car. <laughs> the body for my car is on the on the train coming down." Oh, well, you know, okay. It, it, I don't I don't really know why I did that. Uh, I guess I just like the people I own. You know, I, I, see, I had a fault. In, in that, that I, I always kind of favored suppliers because General Motors, Chevrolet would really take advantage of suppliers, and I, and I saw it. Um, and so it was just kind of natural for me to um, 
represent the suppliers when the, when the chips were down. And I just really, I just really like suppliers. I thought they had got a, kind of a bad shake. Anyway, let's just go through some of these. This is the little brochure. This is the, they had about 80 engineers. The first thing they did when they got the Corvette job was they, what I said, what they call process the job. They took the, the assembly manual and the bill of materials and they checked one against the other to see if they had the right number of parts and all that. And they found a lot of errors in the, uh, in the um, bill of material. So they went to Chevy to get them fixed. Chevrolet said, well, you know, we don't make mistakes. They said, well, <laughs> we did. So I think they got some fixed. But uh, see, it didn't really matter that the bill of material wasn't accurate because the car only got built in St. Louis. So it's wrong, you know, so big deal. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. The parts were bought off of it, but if you got a few more parts than you need, that's not all bad. So, so that was a, a, a plus that uh, Ionia added to the building of the Corvette at those times. So they, they had a they had a planning group, a design group, a prototype group. They had a, a part of their building that was dedicated to, to building prototypes. They built a lot of uh, limousines for Chrysler uh, and other people. They built uh, a lot of specials, uh, and they had a pretty pretty decent resourceful bunch. And I got to know a lot of those guys, and that was really. <coughs> I really enjoyed that too. This is just a little graphic on how molded parts are made. You know, I'm not sure because I wasn't there, but I think the C1s were all bag molded. Does anybody know that? Bag molded mean you know how a golf, a golf cart's made or a boat? You have a mold shaped like the outside of the boat, right? And you put some release material on it, and then you, you put down the glass, and then you put down the, the resin, and you kind of roll it down like that. And there is nothing, to, there is no die for the inside of the part. The inside of the part is just formed by somebody doing that. And we call it bag molding. Now, I think the C2, C1s were like that. I'm almost certain the 53s were. Well, uh, the 60s, when 63 came along, they had matched metal dies. So there was the die for the inside and the outside. And the parts were much more consistent in thickness. And it really increased the quality of the, body, the, the car because there was some control over the, the parts. This was a graphic that was, that was presented in those days because there was no other car built out of fiberglass. And I guess there never has been, never since. Never since. It was just kind of a, a, a graphic. Okay. This is uh, these are pictures inside of Dow Smith's plant. This is the this is when they were building metal bodies. They built I think I told you they built the uh, Oldsmobile and Buick C body wagons from fifty four to or uh, fifty eight to sixty four I believe. So that was just their advertisement for that. Okay. This is another guy I got to know really well. I can't think of his name either, but he was doing the audit. And he's check the the, the uh, deck lid is. Uh, is above the fender, and I think what the specs is 40 thousandths. That looks like a whole bunch more than 40 thousandths. But the but the, uh, the seal held them up, and with time, the seal would settle and the, the fit would become better. So, and of course, everybody knows they were hauled off on, on the train like that. Okay, next year. This is a grab, just a picture of the plant. Uh, this is their molding plant out back. Uh, this is the organization chart for Chevrolet Central Office Quality Control in 1966. Ed Gray was director, and uh, uh, there's me right there. And I worked for John Turek, who worked for Jim Steen. Jim Steen was on the 1930s Lions team, big guy. And he worked for Bob of Charlie, who worked for Ed. But that's, oh, that's, that's the trip, the bunch. Now that's my book, everybody knows about the book. Um, I got a CD. I didn't bring it. It's 20 minutes. I didn't think we'd have time to show it. So maybe some other time. Okay, coming up. Thanks. Uh, in, uh, in June 3rd, we're going to have a car show in Ionia, and everybody's invited. It's uh, about 100 and what, 10, 15 miles, something like that. A couple hours to drive over there, and then the Ionia County Fair, which is always a big gathering. Uh, there will be a parade. And, opportunity to, to get involved with that if you want to in July. Th this is Fred Green. This is the Buicks they used to make. <coughs> this is the, they, they built Shelby's, Shelby Cobras. They built a few cars. I don't think very many, but a few. 
Yeah. And of course the Corvette. That's my Corvette. Now you mean Shelby Mustang? Or Mustang? What did I say? Corvette. Cobra. Or yeah. Cobra. Oh, okay. I never bought Cobras. In Ionia, right near where the plant used to be, they're going to put up a memorial, and they want people. They're looking for people to help them. Um, this is a detail of the memorial. They're going to need about eighty thousand dollars, I think, to do it. Uh, the plant is gone. The plant is now a, a, just a, a flat, nothing there. Um, and the, the memorial is going to have a place on it for plaques. And the little gal who's running it, uh, Linda Saranji, I, I said, if the NCRS supports you, will they get a plaque on the memorial? Oh, she says, absolutely. So, um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, it, they're just getting started, so lots of time to think about it, maybe get involved. And, uh, I know a couple of you have 63 uh, or have a Dow Smith bodies on your Corvettes. It would be really super to have it over there in June when they have their kickoff for this. They would really like that. So uh, that's what that is. At any rate, that's, that's kind of the highlights of what I did for about five or six years. Good job.